Abdullah Latif Abdallah. You're one of the best known living Swahili poets. And at the same time, <laughs> possibly one of the most resilient critiques of the Kenyan government's governments. Um, a recent book about um, Abdi Latif that you can also actually um, get in the back has the very apt title, Poet in Politics. Um, Abdi Latif became the first political prisoner of independent Kenya uh, because of his uncompromising political activism. He was sentenced to three years in solitary confinement and um, there he created one of his most important and well-known poems that were later published under Saudi Adiki, under the name Saudi Adiki, Voice of Agony. Abdul Latif, can I ask you the question that we have asked almost 2,000 Kenyans in our silent room? Are you Kenyan? I had been asked twice to take citizenship. First, when, when I was living in London, after four years there, the, the laws in those days was that after living in England for four years, things have changed now, it's, it's more difficult, but you had the right to become a citizen. So you were just sent forms to apply for citizenship, and I refused, I said, no, thank you very much, I don't want it. And even here in Germany, I received a letter also from the mayor of Hamburg to ask me to, be a, to take citizenship here, I said, no, thank you. I, I don't want to be a foreigner in my own country. And although our new constitution allows dual citizenship, mm -hmm. still, I felt, no, if I take another citizenship, I'll be diluting my Kenyan citizenship. So uh, I refused again. And uh, uh, so I think I am Kenyan, and that's what I believe. It's uh, Yvonne's first book, um, published in 2013, under the title Dust. We're very lucky to have uh, Yvonne Adiabowo here tonight. She is presenting the German translation of her book which was published under the title The Ort an dem die Reise endet, um, which has also inspired the title of our event tonight. What makes you similar to other Kenyans, or what makes you different? Uh, uh, we share uh, space. We share both the imagination and also the delusions. <laughs> um, and uh, most of us, certainly those of us who belong to Nairobi, most of us love to share a cup of coffee at the Java Coffee House. You know, <laughs> um, we share dreams, and uh, certainly one of the other things we absolutely share is uh, the thing I believe will salvage the Kenya situation a wicked sense of humor. Uh, I've never run across a people who can laugh at themselves so profoundly. What's, what's literature's specific approach? What is, what is the specific uh, way of how writing can actually reflect on the country's, on the nation's history? With me, I, from the beginning, I, I don't know, maybe it's because I had no alternative. I, I had no choice. Um, I, from the beginning, decided to be on the side of of, of the have-nots. And partly it's because of the family I was born in and the family I grew in. Uh, I like to tell uh, my audience that our family is a, is a family of troublemakers uh, from long time ago. In fact, from the time of the P Portuguese uh, rule, uh, my, some members of my, of my family were in the resistance, mov resistance movement against the Portuguese. Then came the Arabs. Some of the family members were involved there against the Arabs. And then the British came. Um, my elder brother, who was the, the main person really who politicized me, my elder brother, Sheikh Abdullah Nasser, wo was in that struggle against British rule. And then after independence, he passed the baton to me. And uh, he was the one, in fact, who put me into politics. In those days when I was growing up, as many young people were, I was more interested in music, in Elvis Presley, Beatles, and all that stuff. I didn't have a, <laughs> a knack for, <laughs> for politics. But him being a, first a nationalist, and also a Muslim scholar, he was not so happy with the way 
I was behaving. So what he did was that he made sure that most of the time we were together. So he took me to his political meetings, to his uh, um, lectures at the mosques, when he gave lectures, Islamic lectures. So he politicized me in that way. And by also guiding me on what to read. So he's the one who gave me political books to read. One of which really took me to the extreme left was History Will Absolve Me by Fidel Castro. That book just sent me haywire. And uh, so, uh, apart, so because of that background, I just could not write anything else up except a type of literature which would be, which would, which would give voice for the, to the voiceless and which would uh, campaign or rather fight for, for the rights of those who are downtrodden and who, who don't benefit up to now uh, from what we call independence. The moment, uh, the moment demands or categories are, are created for me, uh, that's the very moment I will seek ways to exclude those particular ca categories and then belong nowhere. But uh, no, I do not. I imagine I'm one of those that um, seek the idea of art for art's sake. But on the other hand, um, art is not, uh, um, it, 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 it's not a floating thing. It, it, it is embedded in the very life and soul of a people, of a landscape, of, of a society, of a happening. Um, so that, that's actually my position. But um, my own sensitization, um, particularly involving um, you know, a, a book like, uh, like Dust, uh, I'm a typical Nairobi, I was a typical Nairobi person before 2005 referendum, 2008. I absolutely needed my Java coffee and just don't bother me with too many details. Just, just make sure there, there's electricity and there's water running kind of thing. But until the moment where we almost lost, uh, lost our country, um, then suddenly the, in many ways, uh, Professor, uh, the, the, what I call the prophetic imperative of his work, Quenda Twendapi, suddenly made sense. 2005, 2007, 2008, when we detonated as a country, and certainly now. Um, but also, uh, going back to the idea of the prophetic imperative, that, uh, pa uh, that uh, uh, pamphlet, pamphlet that you produced, Prof, in 1968, anticipated the hell that would uh, uh, draw our country into an, in, in, into an endless vortex in 1969 with the death of Tom Boyer and everything else, you know, the death of the dream in so many ways, um, which is now where the, the book, uh, you know, quite 2005. Uh, it was a time when the country was uh, post uh, you know, uh, in, in, where they needed a new constitution. I remember walking the streets and hearing what people were saying. What, you know, just the, the you know, people in the streets, what they were saying was completely different to what was the, the official narrative was. And I remember feeling at one po moment on Mamangina Street, feeling very strongly that if the country, if our country could not speak to the ghosts, to the things of silence. Um, this is 2005, and I could hear people talking about the assassination of Tom Boy as if it was just the day before. It was a sense of if, we, if the country cannot find a way to address the things that it is most terrified of addressing, I was terrified we were going to explode, which we did. Um, and it is within that explosion, the, the sense of uh, the threat of the loss of country, uh, the threat of the loss of self, the questioning of what it is to be Kenyan, um, that becomes part of the exploration in uh, in that family story. Well, some 30 bloggers have been arrested, I think, so far, um, and uh, things like that. Other people who have been critical of the government. Just yesterday, I was I read that the one of the famous cartoonist, uh, Gabo Gado, was uh, has been sacked uh, from his work because of. Read, um, uh, for making fun of, of the president. So it, it is as if now those years are coming back, sneaking back quietly. And if Kenyans are not careful, well, we might not go back completely to, to those days, but uh, 
if we are not if Kenyans are not careful, many of the of the freedoms which people fought for for all those times are going to be snatched away from them again. And um, I can foresee, I can foresee that there might be another wave of struggle again um, uh, in Kenya against these dictatorial tendencies which are creeping in back in a very subtle way. And um, many people don't seem to either realize or don't pay attention to them. Many people are just busy trying to make ends meet, busy to, to try and find out where to steal from, and uh, especially those in the government who are in the government. So um, I fear that the situation might get worse again, and uh, we will need another, 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 another struggle to and uh, this comes back now from, from the beginning when, when the country got independence uh, and that was, that's why Kenya of Trenopi came in. I think the mistake which was done there was again, we gained, we gained our independence. But there wasn't enough time or rather those who were in power didn't allow people to, sit, to solidify that independence. When we got our independence which was sort of half-backed independence. So it needed time for people to, to really work on that in order to have, really, to have real independence. But to those who are in power, of course, really, and most of them also took for amassing wealth. That was the main purpose. In fact, those who were those who, most of those who are in the leadership, the majority of them, I mean, their, 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 their idea was to get rich quick. Uh, and that's why when people started to question things and reminding them that this is not what we fought for, people didn't go into the forest and fought the, the, the British, people lost their lives. It was not for amassing wealth, but to, to, to distribute that wealth. Um, the, the men. That was the main thing. Freedom and land. Even the, the so called my mom, the, 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 the formal name was Freedom and Land Army. That, those were the two things which were, people are fighting for. Now, let's, if we look at what, what, what happened in, after independence, is that the very thing which people fought for, the land, which was, of course, appropriated by the, by the settlers, the white settlers there. After independence, Kenya, the first loan which Kenya got was to get a loan from the British government to buy back that land, which was stolen from the people. Now, after it, had, after it was bought back, people again expected that at least that land will be given back to those who are robbed of. But what happened was that it was those who were in power and who had the money and bought that land again. Now, at the moment, in fact, the two-thirds of the land in Kenya is owned by 20% of the people. And most of those people are former presidents. Started with Kenyatta, then came Moi, and Moi Kibaki as well. In fact, these are the three wealthiest land owners in Kenya. They use their position again, to rob the people of that land again. What does it mean for me and for my generation to be Kenya? For the simple reason that uh, I, I know uh, some of the older writers accuse us of navel gazing, which, which, which is true, <laughs> uh, we are. Um, for us, the oppressor is not necessarily the, the place of disillusion. And, and we've also, also been, our generation has also been described as the disillusion post, uh, <laughs> post colonials. But simply because the idea of the oppressor, the demon, the terror, is not the, um, uh, the archetypal colonial person. It's not the British uh, that is our challenge, our problem, and the very thing that we need to look at. The people that have wounded our dreams are very much our parents. 
okay um these are the 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 these are the people people we know people who look like us people who made big promises to us um the oppressor, the people who have uh, cracked and betrayed the Kenyan ideal, are our own people. So the, the part of the angst, the anguish, um, but also the interrogation is, what does that mean? How are you going to, how does our generation or, or our children then say that actually um, the thief, the murderer, the assassin is my daddy, is my mummy? The, uh, the plunderer of the Kenyan national, uh, national economy is my uncle. Um, does that then mean that we create excuses for them? Uh, do we then develop narratives to justify this? Because it is even more painful to acknowledge the fact that the, the face of horror in the mirror is our own. It's more, far more painful, and I know certainly uh, being here in German society, I think that's also part of the journey that, uh, as a society, you've also you're also constantly undertaking. So no, um, I, I think for me, and I think for a lot of my peers, it's a it's a time of constant questioning and understanding. What does Project Kenya actually mean? Does Project Kenya actually still exist? The great historian. Um, um, Ogot, who was very much part of the conceptualizing of Kenya um, yeah, yeah, um, before independence and just after independence, has said, I think a couple of years ago, said, Project Kenya is dead. Apart being a f family of troublemakers, especially for those who are in power, uh, it's also a family of artists. Uh, in the family, we have painters, we have uh, singers and poets as well. And uh, two of the people who, who influenced me a lot, uh, uh, my poetry was my, uh, my, 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 my great uncle who brought me up from the age of three till, till when he died in 1962. He himself was a poet. He was a teacher, he was a school teacher, he was a Quran reciter and also a poet. And they had a weekly program of the then Saudi Amvita, which was the voice of Mombasa, uh, where he, he, he recited his poems weekly. And what happened was that before, after, 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 write, after composing his poems, before going to recite them, at the, record them at the radio station, he used to give me to read them. So that's how I was introduced to poetry, in fact, by him, by him reading me letting me to read his poems before he went. And then my elder brother, my other elder brother, who is a, who's a major Swahili poet, Ahmed Nasir. Again, he was another influence. And both of them was wrote in Kiswahili. And also the, the environment I grew up in, um, it was a Swahili, a Swahili environment. Uh, English <laughs> was only spoken at school. I didn't come, I didn't encounter anywhere and I encountered it anywhere else except at school. So language, has, uh, Kiswahili has been my, uh, my mother tongue and also my you know, environment tongue, if I could say that. So, and uh, I ended up writing in Kiswahili. In fact, uh, in all my writing career, I've written only four poems in English, uh, one of which you had asked me to, to, to read tonight. But the rest is uh, in Kiswahili. And, um, and mainly it's because uh, that is the language in which I'm comfortable in, in which I, can, I have uh, confidence in. Uh, with the English, I have to look for words. <laughs> Not with Kiswahili. They come, they just uh, flow. Um, and uh, especially in my writing in Kimvita, in my dialect of Mombasa. Uh, this dialect nowadays, because of the, of the influx of people from other parts of Kenya, in fact, this dialect is dying out now. Uh, not, even, not even young people who are Swahilis themselves, who are born in Mombasa, with both parents from Mombasa, many of them nowadays, if you listen to what they speak, it's not the Swahili I knew. <laughs> uh, so now, by, again, by writing in this dialect of mine, 
again, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a language which, uh, especially when it comes to poetry, it's, 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 it's not at par with standard Kiswahili. Standard Kiswahili lacks so many things. I've been, I taught it, but I always taught my, told my students, if I had a, a free will, I wouldn't have taught you this. <laughs> Especially when it comes to poetry, it restricts you a lot. With, whereas with Kimvita, and all these different sounds, which, uh, which are not, which you cannot find in standard Kiswahili. Um, in Kimvita, for example, we have four different types of T, letter T, how to pronounce it. Four different ways. Letter D, we have about three, two different ways of pronouncing it, and other and many other letters. Now this. Since poetry is about, it's not only about words, but it's also about sounds. Poetry is not only words, but sounds. That's what makes poetry poetry. We're an English-speaking household, but a Kenya English-speaking household and Luo. Um, but uh, we navigated our world and each other mostly through English. So I lay claim, full claim to English. Um, and I lay claim to the English um, of, of my landscape. Um, the way I describe a zebra is not necessarily the way a Londoner will ever describe a zebra. Um, so I make no apology to my love, actually, passion for the language, uh, both English. But I, I love all, all forms of language. But I'm, I encountered the, what I call the, my prophets, uh, Tolkien, Austin, Chesterton even Aikweyama, um, Achebe, uh, through the medium, the environment, the world of English. And uh, that's where I play. During the, those two decades that repression was intensified in Kenya, but at the same time, thankfully, people didn't just accept it. People resisted it in various forms. Uh, one of them was for, through underground activities. Um, in the 1980s, I moved to London in 1979, so in the 1980s, as I was in London. And in 1982, there was a coup attempt, a military coup attempt in Kenya, which thankfully did not succeed. Although the, those who were in power, of course, we didn't like them, but we didn't, uh, at least those of us who are active in uh, political activities, we didn't want to have a military government there because we had already seen what military gov governments have done in Africa, uh, especially in West Africa. So thankfully it didn't succeed. But the, the reaction of the government against that coup was unbelievable. So many people were killed especially those who are the government either imagined or thought that they were against the government. So many people were arrested. So many people just disappeared. Up to now, we don't know where they are. They must have been killed. Now, <clears throat> as I said, I was already in London those days. Ngugi Wathiongo had come to London to launch his new book there when the coup attempt happened. So a message was sent to him that he should not go back home because they were waiting for him. Many of the university lecturers who were on the left side of politics were arrested. Some had to flee the country. And, uh, some were uh, killed as well. So he was warned not to go back. So he was stranded in London. I remember at that time we were only about five of us got together, five of Kenyans. And we said we cannot just sit idly by here in relative freedom and do nothing. Uh, we have to do something about it. So we started first with the Committee for the Release of Political Prisoners in Kenya, which, was, which we formed in July 19, uh, so, sorry, in, in, in August 1982. Uh, we worked with that committee for five years, fighting for those who were arrested. But then later on, we thought that we must have a political movement because that was a human rights committee. Now we formed a political movement, United 
uh, movement for democracy in Kenya. Now, when we were, we were doing our activities in London, the government sent me sent to me a messenger to come and talk to me, to tell me not to continue with the struggle which we were waging then. And again there, they used the tribal card because the majority of those whom I was working with were from the Kikuyu community. And then they came with this, that uh, why, why, why do you get involved with these people? I mean, they are against this government because it's not a Kikuyu who is leading it. So we would advise you not to get involved with this. And in fact, the government would be happy to let you come back home because by then I, I, lived, I, stayed, I lived in exile for 22 years without being able to go back home. So they said, if you, if you disassociate yourself with them, the government will allow you, will allow you back. And, uh, and also will be, the government will be ready to give you whatever you say you want to give. Uh, so it was one way of bribing me. So I told that messenger, go back to the government, and he said that he was sent by the president himself. Go back and tell him that I'm not interested in that offer. I did not, since when I was a youth, I didn't get in, myself involved in political activities for any material gain. I believe that things were wrong in my country. I believe that I have to do something to make things right. So and then they sent another person the second time. And this time they sent somebody who was, who was a relative of mine, <laughs> again, to talk to me about the same thing. I sent this person back again the same way. Now, this poem, therefore, was, a, was a, as, as if it was a response to that offer. I'm talking to the president here, President Moi. Um, Moi came with his, his very funny philosophy. It's called Nyayo philosophy, meaning footsteps. Uh, he, he meant that he was following Yomo Kenyatta's foot, foot, footsteps, and he really followed them. In fact, he, he became uh, an expert in that because the atrocities he committed were more than what Kenyatta did. So, and he called that philosophy peace, love, and unity. So this poem is called Peace, Love, and Unity for Whom? So I'm talking to now, at the end of the poem, I'm finishing the poem with, the, with those who are familiar with the Quran, with the first 11 verses of chapter 81 from the Quran, which talks about the judgment day. So when you hear me, the last, the last line saying when, starting each line with when, 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 those are verses from the Quran. It's talking about judgment day, you know? Meaning here that there will come a time, there will come a judgment day. Kenyans will judge those who committed all those atrocities. Unfortunately, up to now, nothing has happened uh, because of the impunity which we have there. Anyway, right. So, and so you come and talk to me about peace, love, and unity, expecting me to agree, parroting your parody in my poetry, decorating your tyranny with bouquets of perfumed words and imagery to drive away the stench of your treachery and hoodwink humanity. I refuse. I refuse to enter my brain and ask it to entertain even the sound of the idea that our loves should be one. Because what by love you define doesn't tally with mine. I love my heroes. You ignore, persecute, and kill. You love my enemies who rob and enslave me still. How then can there be love between you and me when the beats of our heart's music are not in harmony, when our hearts pump in and out different colors of blood? No, I refuse. I refuse to sing your song of submission and despair. I will instead forge my own words, which will cry out for my martyred heroes, past and present, whose blood and tears and death and soil and toil gave life to the tree of the freedom of my soil, 
those who always sought for freedom of speech and thought and refused to bend or be bought, those whose faith never went to call for freedom to each and all, whose courage was their shield and with their spear of truth they fought and killed, those who with their lives they saw that come what may, onward they will go till their humanity they restore. Every day, every minute, I hear the bones and blood of my heroes declare there is a debt to square. Them we have not forgotten. Them we will always honor and mention. With their memories, we shall rekindle the fire, spreading its flames of wrath and ire to burn the roots of our oppression and uncover your every evil intention. How then can there be peace between us? How can there be peace between us when I'll never accept to bury the people's anger in the tomb of my verse? How can I forget decades and decades of my people's suffering and pain, of tears and blood pouring from their struggling limbs like rain? How can I ask them to sing your songs in high volume, to stifle the tormented sounds of those you torture and maim? How can I draw veils over their eyes to conceal and eclipse the scenes of numerous massacres? I can still hear the echo of those dead proclaiming our country, our wounded, mutilated country, where the dead are not dead and the living are not living, our country sculpted in fire and blood, where the north is barren and the south is hard, our country in death, we still bleed for you because we have decided to fear death less and decided to love death more. Because if by living we are dying, why then not die a little more so that we can live longer? Should I ignore these voices of these noble daughters and sons of my land? No, I refuse. For it is their unity I crave for. Shoulder to shoulder, arm in arm we go, not with you, whom we happen to know that you take from a lamb and give to a lion more. You, who have torn our house in two, ignoring the majority and favoring the few. But when the sun is darkened, when the stars fall and disperse, when the mountains are made to move away, when the camels 10 months pregnant are left untended, when the wild beasts are brought together, when the seas are set alight, when the souls are paired like with like, when the infant girl buried alive is asked, for what crime was she slain? When the records are laid open and the sky is stripped bare and there's nowhere to hide, you who today judges shall be the accused. Is this, is this where, where, Kenya, where are we headed in 2016? And can there be peace? Of course there can. Uh, we've known seasons of great peace. I was there in 2002. I was one of the millions at Uhuru Park. Uh, when Kibaki was being made president. Uh, I remember my hand, uh, there was no, absolutely, this, it was, you know, there was absolutely no space. My manager uh, next to somebody, ordinary Kenyans around a tree and uh, carrying my handbag. These guys took, took my handbag and told me, you know, go up the tree, we'll, we'll look after your handbag. And it was all fine. And, it, and we were an amazing people then. Uh, there was a, uh, there's never been a moment, I, I will never forget that moment of immense possibility. Uh, we were beautiful, we were one, we were an immense people. Uh, we were peaceful, more, but more than peace, if you can imagine it, tight, tightly packed space, a million people at least. And there was just euphoria and laughter and strength. And like I say, those double rainbows, literally. I did, as it's as if the whole world, the whole universe had descended um, to live among us, to be among us in celebration. 
Um, so I, I, I'm, it's, it's not, I, I'm, not, I'm not saying this because of the, nost not about nostalgia, it's about the, the truth, the realization, and part of my own drive, part of the thing driving me is the knowledge that we have been there. We know what that looks like. We know how amazing, how what amazing smells and tastes and feels like. Uh, we know what unity is. We know what love. Uh, you know, we know how we have known love, I've known love, belonging, and being. Um, at that in that year, we were the. I think there was a poll taken all over the world, and we were the most. Kenya was the most optimistic nation in the whole world. Yes. Has, has that changed in the last polls? It has, yes, it has since changed. So it's the knowledge of having been there. Um, and so fine, we are now trying to redefine, we're trying to find out who we are. Uh, we tried many things, the constitution, the devolution, I hope this were, these were going to be the templates for peace. You ask me, can peace be possible? I, I say, of course it can. I don't think we have a choice, number one. Um, how we'll get there, I don't know. Uh, it may require struggle. Um, but uh, it will also require honesty. And that, and that includes personal honesty before we look at society, before we look at the president or the leadership. Um, in me, there is a tribalist. In me, there is a, a thief. In me, there is, I have a prize. Uh, if somebody would offer me $2 billion, I think that's the current going rate, um, to rob a bank in Kenya, I might take it. <laughs> so I need to make peace. I need to find a way to exercise my particular brand of demon. But it's not just me, but it's the entire population. Can we do that? I don't know. But we need to be able to do that. We need to face up to our particular brand of bullshit and uh, lay it aside. It's not to look at anybody else. I think the struggle, and I think it's the same struggle I believe your society and Europe is having. Just as an aside, I am appalled by the discombobulation, that's the word, of Europe around the refugee, the so-called refugee situation, which you're calling a crisis. It's not. But it's about looking within. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> It's about this human struggle and a human fear about looking within. Can we do it as Kenya? I, I hope so. We have too beautiful a country to lose. I was one of those few people who are not very optimistic. I didn't expect that things will change with these people. Because when you looked around, it was the same group of people. It was only Mohi who was missing. <laughs> the president, who be the one who became the president, was the vice president of Moi, Moi Kibaki. And all those who are around, I'm not around him, are the same group of people who have been, some of whom have been since Jomo Kenyatta's time, and then came Moi. And so you cannot expect that these people will behave differently. First, they were not in the opposition party, which or the opposition coalition, which won the, the elections, out of conviction. No. Most of them, in fact, joined the opposition parties at the last minute when they saw the writing on the wall that Khan was going to lose the elections. So in order to, men, to, to retain their positions of power, they just jumped the boat and joined the opposition parties and ended up in government once, once again. So I remember I even wrote a poem about that. Now, when I was being interviewed in the radios and with some Kenyans who heard about me saying that, no, nothing is going to change, they, some, of, some of my friends said, well, come on, Abdelatif, now you're just, you just used to being in the opposition. <laughs> but I said, no, I, it's, it's, I'm just being realistic. I cannot expect these people to, to bring about changes. No. And especially with our political, so-called political parties, I always say that we don't have political parties in Kenya. We don't. It's just a groupings of people who come together, especially when there's an election around, in order to contest the elections. And then, the part, how can you have a party without, without ideology? It's absurd. Anyway, so I didn't expect anything. Now, another point here which I wanted to make was that, and this is the things which Kenyans have to learn, they should stop. They should stop pinning their hopes 
on these politicians which we have in Kenya. Nothing will change with them. People have to try and devise other ways. They have to form their own parties which will fight for their own interests instead of joining these, these clowns and, uh, and in, in their parties. So, and here, this is another thing which I always say. You know, when we got independence, the first years of independence, we, all, we, we blamed everything on the colonialists, colonialism. Me, I was one of them too. But and then after a while, I stopped because we had, we have, we, 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 the governments have been in, in our hands for quite some time. We should have changed whatever was bad, which, which was brought by colonialists. We didn't, so it's, we should blame ourselves. And this time also, this is what I, in fact, when I was in Nairobi in December, I was saying the Kenyans should stop blaming the politicians for the, for the situation in which it is in the country. Because it's you, the people, who elect these people and put them in power. I mean, they have, they, have, they, have, they have betrayed you all this time, and yet you keep on voting them back, and then you complain. I mean, you shouldn't complain. They are just behaving the way they know. You are the ones who put them there. So it's upon Kenyans to, to find other ways of, of, of bringing about these changes, um, and, and, and one of which would be perhaps to start Real political parties, vanguard parties, which will, and it's a difficult, it's, it's, it's a hard job, and we should not expect that things will change in 10, 20, 30 years' time, but there have to be these struggles, as they say, it's, a, it's, it's not a, an, an event, but a process. Many of those who later on became independent or won their liberation, it took them years, decades, before they got where they got, uh, including our fight for independence of our country. It took decades, more than 60 years, before we got independence. So Kenyans have to organize themselves in a different way to, in order to bring about these changes. I'd been away for two years. I come back, and at that time, the airport had just burnt. I remember feeling as if I'd walked into, you guys know the Salvador Dali memory of time, where the, literally, that thing of what, where is my country? I felt like I was walking into the landscape of memories of time and everything was kind of drippy and, and strange. The surreal feeling has not disappeared yet. Um, but uh, be, being Kenyan, the kind of, uh, we've kind of redefined the notion of the stiff upper lip, everything is fine. And even if your petticoats are frayed and your bombs are exposed, we are fine, but we are not. I don't know, maybe the answer may be a very simple thing. Maybe it's the need for the conversations we need to have. We need, and, and it's very, very, I don't know why it's particular. Maybe, you, maybe Malim, you can tell us why is it so difficult to talk about uh, just to speak, just to speak as Kenyans, and uh, maybe to uh, to lay out the ghosts. We have never mourned, for example, uh, Tom Boyer's passing. No one, the country hasn't. Can we come together and grieve? I don't know. I don't have an answer. But they are, I know the things that I need. I know I need to cry. N not as Yvonne, I need to cry as a Kenyan, and I don't want to cry alone. I, I know I need to mourn and grieve over something and to key it, to, to wail. Youth is about change, bringing about change. Many of us, me, I started when I was 19 years old to be active. I went to prison when I was 22 years old. So I pin my hopes on the, on the youth. But the youth need to have examples or mentors. Me, myself, I was, apart from this elder brother of mine, when I looked around Kenya, especially during the independence struggle, there were many people there whom I associated myself with and who were my heroes. One of them was Jomo Kenyatta himself. He was my hero. It's only when, when he started misbehaving that I started to oppose him. General Mogi Oginga Odinga was another one. 
In fact, he was, he was, he was my leader because I joined the Kenya People's Union when I was 19 and I was at Livering Zone. So, Kagia and the others, that's within the country. Outside the country, there were other people who influenced me politically as well. The Che Guevara, Fidel Castro, Michael Max, and all those troublemakers, yeah? <laughs> so, youth need mentors. Unfortunately, at the moment, apart from very few Kenyans who are in the limelight, who are political leadership, most of them, one cannot be inspired by them. Therefore, the youth do not have a concrete example to follow there. Now, but still, that should not be an excuse, really. Because, uh, and again, this is what I tell people, the young people whenever I'm in Kenya, is that, that they should start by having groups, just discussion groups. This is how we started. When we saw things were not going the right way, first we just met and discussed what was happening in the country. Action came later, after discussion and after understanding the problems, and then we tried to find out what should we do in order to bring about these changes. So it should start with that, discussion groups. And as I said earlier, also to Kenyans have to think about forming a political party, a real political party which with, with ideology and with, uh, with concrete policies. Um, then the rest, I think, will come through that. Um, after those, in those discussions, uh, people will come up with, uh, with, 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 with solutions or what should be done in order to, to advance uh, uh, the cause. Um, unfortunately now, <laughs> I don't know, when I compared some of the youth, which uh, present youth and, and, and ourselves then, I don't know where, maybe it was because we experienced colonialism, some of us. Therefore, we still had that anger in us that, uh, no, this is what we were fighting against. And these people are continuing with the same practices. So we experienced the, 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 the evil of colonialism. We didn't want it to continue. Whereas with the youth in the present time, they didn't go through that. As I said, many of them came, were born and grew up in, in this relative freedom. And uh, in quotes, prosperity. So some of them don't see the reason why they should rock their boats. As I said, as uh, Yvonne said earlier, her interest earlier was to see that there was water running in the house, there was electricity, gets her, and, and Java and Java was having, what else do you want? <laughs> the rest, you left it to, to politicians, <laughs> right? And this, as I said, politics is too important to be left to politicians alone. We need new ways, we need new answers, we need a new vocabulary, we need a new language for what is happening in our country. Grassroots, we've done that. Computers, we've done that. Organizing people, all the way from Turkana, down to a place called Wothogi, done that too. But it's brought us into the same situation where we have, and we, some of us have been doing this for over 20 years. And we have, I think one of the things we do need to come to a point of realization as a country, and as somebody who has been active, politically active in very quiet ways and literary and creative ways as well, not just in Nairobi, throughout Kenya, is simply this. We've come to a place of stasis the old ways do not work. And I remember when people, when people gathered to lament uh, the failure of 2013, and these were you know, major activists, we gathered around Inuka Trust, uh, run by John Givongo. And I remember what one of our great uh, technologists said, you are outplanned, you are outstrategized, you are outperformed. For the last couple of years, the NGO sector has been in a total crisis of identity and of strategy. And I've been one of the most critical people, saying that you cannot use 1960 strategies on a, on a 21st century political machine. You cannot. 
Not when these guys hire multi-billion dollar uh, UK-based perception management organizations. However many computers you contribute to the grassroots, I promise you this, it is not going to make a difference. It's not, not because, because, no, 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 listen to me. I'm saying this because, no, no, sit, listen to me. <laughs> what I'm telling you is this, you have got a highly, mov a, 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 a people who are, have got 3G communication systems. People have moved mobile. Internet is being streamed on the phone right now. That is actually where a lot of action is taking place, right down in the grassroots, including uh, among my friends in Turkana. So what I'm trying to tell you, and, and this is the challenge, and I think that's the challenge also Professor has put. We need from you, young people, new questions. We need from you a new form of vocabulary, a new imagination. The old imagination does not work. We need another language from you. The challenge is that that's a harder story. And that is the greater challenge. And when I say I don't know, it's coming, it's coming from a place of saying the old answers do not work, no longer work, and I don't know who's going to. It's such a struggle to imagine a new way. Uh, the other day I was joking, uh, telling a friend of mine, I said, if I had power in Kenya, I would just abolish parliament. Really. It's useless. And, and I would instead, for, for about maybe for 20 years, We'll have, we'll have a technocrats running the country and just get rid of these members, useless members of parliament. And instead use that money, billions of money, because we, as you know, our members of parliament, I think, are among the highest paid in the world. In fact, some of them are, are paid more than the, donor, the members of parliament in donor countries. We come here and beg, and your members of parliament the, the salaries they, they receive is lower than what our members of parliament. So I would have just abolished that because it's just useless. Anyway, since we do elect them, then let, let us at least elect people who we know will work for, for Kenya and for, for, for Kenyans. Most in our elections, as we know, most, most we, we elect people whom perhaps we elect somebody because he comes from my tribe or somebody who has paid more money, people sell their votes, as you know. People will be given just 100 shillings, and you sell your five years of your life for 100 shillings by voting for that person, whom you, that person has proved that he's hopeless, he's useless, and still people vote them in for either tri tri for, for tribal reasons or for, 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 for monetary reasons and things like that. This is what I was saying. Okay, let's, let's elect people, but let's elect the right people. And partly, partly it's because maybe people keep on repeating that mistake. Maybe there is a need to have political education in Kenya. It seems as if people are not politically educated. So it's not a question of not, 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 not voting people at all or not electing people at all, but electing the right people. This is what I meant by that. Coming to the social media, yes, I've, I've seen that in social media because I, I do read almost all the Kenyan paper every day, every Kenyan papers in the, in the internet, and I see the, I, um, what interests me more is what people, uh, people's reaction to, to those stories. It's very good, but it should not end there. The problem with that is that many people think that once one has written something there, that's it, it's finished, this job is finished. These people, I mean, they don't care what you say about them. Say whatever you want, but they will continue to do what they want. It's important to comment, to give these reactions, but at the same time, those words have to be followed by action. And it's... <sighs> The problem with, that, with, 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 with writing in the internet and these social media is that those people never meet. People, they're, they're, they're from different parts of it. Some of them may be in, in the diaspora. There is a need to, for people to sit down together and discuss things. And you know, again, if I, if I give you the experience of, of our activities, I told you about this uh, first um, committee which we formed in London. Committee for the Release of Political Prisoners. We worked together for five years. And while we were working in those five years, 
we were studying each other. Because you cannot just rise up and say, okay, let's form a political movement. You don't know the people whom you're working with. We scrutinized each other. And I remember we started with about 14 people. We ended up with only seven of us. After I said, ah, these now, seven of us, we can work together. Then we, because we had trusted each other. We tested each other different, in different ways. Now, you cannot just by commenting on the internet and things that uh, things will change. People need to really to, to sit down and discuss things and come out with, uh, with solutions on what to be done, which you cannot do by in the in, in, in internet. Yes, you can. Again, how many people have access to that? The nature of art is to find a way to uh, to sneak away uh, of expression. You will. There is always a way of expression. Um, the role of the writer remains the same one. It has always been, I guess. Um, the writer as artist, certainly in, in my case, I'm not a non-fiction writer, uh, as witness, as a reluctant prophet, perhaps, as somebody who wants to uh, somebody who who uh, wants to wallow in delusion. <laughs> Um, perhaps, um, to ask the questions. And ultimately at the core of most uh, artistic questions is that um, eternal question, what, what does it actually mean to be human? Uh, not in a generic way, in my particular case, it would be what does it mean to be human in Kenya? I'll, I'll, I'll read uh, from uh, uh, the section where the, um, uh, the, the, the father character, Nupir, is uh, on a plane taking his dead son home. Um, his daughter's with him, so a lot of the memories now come, the memories that he has suppressed come flooding in. Today, the past, the past's beckon is persistent. From the air, Nye peer, peers down at an expanding abyss. His country, his home, is ripping itself apart. Stillborn ba ballot revolution, these 2007 elections were supposed to be simple. The next small jump into a light-filled Kenyan future. Everything had instead disintegrated into a single and ending howl by the nation's unrequited dead. This country, this haunted ideal, all its poor broken promises. Nipir watches armpits damp, a view of, of ground-lit smoke, dry lips. His people had never set their nation on fire before. On the ground that night in a furtive ceremony, beneath a half moon, a chubby man will mutter an oath that will render him the president of a burning, dying country. The deed will add fuel to an already out of control national grieving. Nipir turns from the window, he is flying home with his children, yet he is alone. Memories are solitary ghosts. He lets them in, traveling with them. Down country, December 12th, 1963. Linges, a soldier, hoisted a red, black, green, and white flag up in a park. The flag collected sparks and visions drifting like clouds. In that arena of spectacle, Nipir Oganda had led a cavalcade lug, lugging a smaller red, black, brown, and white flag while riding on a high-stepping black horse. He had shrieked as if expelling a fiend. Eyes left, clip-clop, clip-clop, hooves and blurring vision, men on a podium, some who he thought had died. Two men he knew had pounded other men to death. Another had been detained for his own safety and been supplied with a stream of world literature and unlovely comfort women. One of them he married. He had focused on one man, Tom Joseph Mboya, who had colored in the red, green, white, and black flag. He had years before scoured the landscape and found promising souls that he sent to America to study, experience, and then come back home with transcendent dreams. The leader of the nation had tilted his head at the tracker policeman carrying the Kenya flag, a dark man on a black horse. 
in his sweaty palms, the flag had almost slipped as Nupir had bellowed, eyes front. A mosaic people had cheered, wanderers, cattlemen, camel herders, fishermen and hunters, dreamers, strangers, gatherers and farmers, trading nations, empire builders, and the forgetful. Such were the people for whom Nupir had carried the new Kenya flag. There was also the anthem created from a Pokomo mother's lullaby. O God of all creation, bless this our land and nation. Justice be our shield and defender. Blended cultures intoxicating fusion. The new revised Kenya. Bead kofia on his head, cloaked, fly whisk flicking. The leader spoke. His voice was a bass drum. Glory, goodness, forgiveness, education, work hard. Nyepir had tended the firelit euphoria inside his body. Harambe, a nation brought to task in a clarion call that had hauled steel across the land and built a railway. The national summons, response, a howled, eh. Hey! But then came the fear. It split words into smaller and smaller fragments until words became secret, suffocating, and silent. No one cried when the voracious, frenzied seizing of lives began. A new word sli slithered into the landscape. Nyakua. Plunder, possess. Entitled brigandage. It was cleansed to mean hard work. In the nation, slow horror, as if all had woken up to a vision of violating, crowing goals, crowding their beds. Nipir remembers how bodies started to stoop to contain the shame, the loss, the eclipse. Such eyes turned inward silence, in, such eyes turned inward silences, so that when bodies started showing up, mutilated and truly dead, the loudest protests were created out of whispers. To protect new post-independence citizen children, like most new Kenya parents denying soul betrayals, Nipir built illusions of another Kenya, shouting out the words of the national anthem when he could, as if the volume alone would remove the rust eating into national hopes. Keeping mouths, ears, and eyes shut, parents had petitioned sorrow, purchased even more silence, and promised a better future. Plane drone, slight turbulence, they bounce. Better future. It's a groan in Nupir's head. He rubs its tautness. His daughter is staring through the plane's window. Below, more greenhouses, flower farms, Aldonio Kerry, Mount Kenya, a sentinel. That is a revelation. Nipir shouts, the mountain. The pilot looks back. My son, uh, he likes Nipir vo Nipir's voice cracks. The pilot scans the horizon and swings, swings the plane right to circumnavigate Mount Kenya. Batian, Lenana, Makalda, he intones. The late afternoon sun has colored the sparse snow's crimson. His daughter squashes her face against the window pane and feels the northward swing in her body. Soon, the flamingos appear on oyster shell-colored water next to the milk-blue Annam Kaala Kol, Lake Turkana. The pilot says, there's Lake Lugipi. They know this is their territory. Teleki's volcano, a brown bowl, windy landforms. They pass over Loyangalani towards Mount Kulal, shift northeast towards Kalachagoda. They level over the salt flats fringing the Chalbi Desert. Huri Hills in the dusk light, and then below, a wide and kempt stripe carved into the land. The plane flies through the layers of time, reveals the hollowed brown rocks below, where his children would survey the rustling mar march of desert locusts. Dry gold brown pastures where livestock browse, and they would run after homemade kites. Eat cactus berries and curse one of the land's visiting winds, which had ripped the kites to shreds. They had reached Wothogik. They had reached home. There's one poem in this collection of, of 
poems which I wrote in prison. Uh, and I wrote these poems on toilet paper because I was not allowed any reading or reading material, writing or reading material in the solitary confinement I had. But uh, I used toilet paper and one of the warders who were my permanent guards, I had befriended him and uh, I had asked him for a pencil and he brought me, he smuggled in a small piece of pencil which I used to write this. Um, now, one of the poems which are in there, and I say that if I had only written that poem, just that one poem would have been sufficient for me. Uh, this poem is called Siwati. <clears throat> Siwati, it means I will never abandon, meaning my conviction, uh, despite the hardships I was going through there. Um, now, this poem was first was to to assure, reassure my elder brother, this brother of mine who put me into all these things, this political thing, that I will never abandon my conviction. And this is partly because when I was writing those pamphlets, because Kenya Tundapi was the seventh pamphlet, I used to write them every month. Uh, I managed to to evade arrest in those six ones, they didn't know who it was. But the last one, Kenya Tundapi, I was betrayed by one of my my my, my comrades, uh, who was who became the star, the main prosecution witness in my trial. Now, when I was writing those pamphlets, especially the last one, my, this elder brother of mine told me that this pamphlet is going to land you into problems. You must tone down the language in this pamphlet. But I refused. I said no. So what he did, he was asking me, are you sure you want to, to this language to remain as it is? I said yes. Because he told me this time they're going to arrest you. Are you prepared for that? I said, well, I said, yes, I'm prepared for that because the worst, the worst, if I'm lucky, they will arrest me. If the worst comes to the worst, they will kill me. I said, are you prepared for all that? I said, yes, I'm prepared for that. So he gave me an advice. I said, if you are prepared for all that and you believe that once they arrest you and put you into trouble, you won't surrender or give up your conviction, okay, you have my blessing, go. But if you have a small doubt in your heart that once they start arresting you, you'll abandon your conviction, then better abandon it now. So when in prison, I was, I could not send this poem to him because I wasn't allowed any letters to send letters or even family was not allowed to visit me. So I wrote this poem. Uh, unfortunately, you won't have the translation. But the gist of it is that I'm saying that despite the hardship, despite the hardship I'm going through here in prison, I will never abandon my conviction. And even if I am released, I'll continue with the struggle. Siwati nshishielo, siwati. Kwani ni wate? Siwati ni nilo hilo talishika kwa vyovyote? Siwati ni miminalo hapano au popote? Hadi kaburini sote miminalo tufukiwe. Siwati ngaadhibiwa adhabu kila mifano? Siwati ni ngaambiwa tapawa kila kinono? Siwati lilosawa. Silibandui mkono hata ni ngaumwa meno mkono siubandui. Siwati Si ushindani mukasema na shindana. Si wati ifahamuni sababu ya waungwana. Si wati ndangu imani ni thaminio sana na kuivata naona itakuwa ni muhali. Si wati ni meradhiwa kufikwa na kila mawi. Si wati ni ngaambiwa ni aminio hayawi. Si wati ni, kisha nikawa kama nzi hivyo siwi. Thama na kariri siwi na mungu nisaidia. Thank you so much. Thanks to all of you. Please join us outside for a drink, a little bite to eat. Inside? Okay, it will be outside on the right. Um, thanks so much for coming. Thanks again to the two of you. Have a safe journey home.